Greetings and welcome to In Depth. I'm DK Rasta. Are you a major importer of HFCs or hydrofluorocarbons? Well, soon enough, licenses will be needed from the Trade and Licenses Unit, as well as Pesticide and Toxic Chemicals Unit. All this as TNT will begin to phase down HFCs from January 1, 2024. To tell us more, we have Ozone Specialist Jonathan Bolai coming from the Ozone Unit at the Ministry of Planning and Development. Mr. Bolai, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. And I want to start off actually getting an idea, what is the National Ozone Unit, please? Sure, not a problem. Um, the National Ozone Unit is part of the Environment and Policy Planning Division within the Ministry of Planning and Development. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Environment and Policy Planning Division, we are responsible for being the guiding and formulating environmental policies keeping in line with government's framework for sustainable development, as well as the national environmental policy. So what this essentially means is that we strike a balance between economic development, social inclusion, as well as environmental sustainability. Um, within the division as well, we also have what we call the multilateral environmental unit where the national ozone unit is housed. And those who are not familiar with the MEA unit, for example, we deal with various multilateral environmental agreements, such as climate change, biodiversity waste, and ozone depletion. So much of our conversation will be circulated around ozone depletion and what the National Ozone Unit does. And with that in mind, and, and yes, the question is, what is ozone depletion? Because sometimes it seems as though I hear a little less about ozone depletion. Yes, we hear about climate change, but the way that we used to be hearing, there's a hole in the ozone layer, there's a hole in the ozone layer. What is that ozone layer and what is ozone depletion? Sure, not a problem. So I'll take a step back and explain what the ozone layer is. Essentially, the ozone layer is an invisible shield. That's, a rough, that's roughly about 10 miles above the Earth's surface. Um, this shield provides a very important function as it helps sustain life on Earth. It also, it also filters UV radiation from the sun. And in the absence of this, life would not be habitable. So back in the late 1980s, um, scientists would have realized that certain man-made chemicals called ODSs or ozone depleting substances were destroying the protective layer of this ozone geo. Um, now at that time, the major substance was CFCs, what we call chlorofluorocarbons. Now you don't hear about this anymore because we've successfully phased it out. Um, and at the time it was considered the wonder gas. So they were found in refrigeration and air conditioning, also as a propellant in um, um, aerosols, also as a foaming agent for building insulation and stuff like that. Um, so in 1989, Trinidad and Tobago alongside the rest of the world would have signed on to what we call the Vienna Convention and this Montreal Protocol for the Protection of the Ozone Lake. Now, what this essentially means is that we have no um, signatory to preserve in this ozone layer by reducing the production and consumption of these ODSs. Now, Trinidad and Tobago does not produce any of these ODSs, we import it. Um, so as a country, we have phased this out, as I rightfully said, we also phased out what we call halons. And these are found in the firefighting sector, mainly in the um, fire extinguishers. And essentially, the National Ozone spearheads all of these activities under the Montreal Protocol. Thank you. In the terms of depletion, what is depletion? And so, yes, we, we've spoken about the ODSs, but are there any other ways that we find the ozone layer being depleted? Yes, so the depletion aspect happens when we basically, when these ODSs are released from the equipment or these gases from refrigeration or air conditioning. This usually happens when we have bad refrigeration practices going on. So when technicians usually service these ACs, um, sometimes if they're not properly trained, they would vent these gases up into the air. And then that process really depletes the ozone layer as we 
as these CFCs and these bromide molecules within the um, particular substance basically eats away at the um, this protective layer and therefore encouraging more insert more UV radiation. And that's extremely bad because you get more incidences of skin cancer, eye cataracts, and then you also have issues with the environment as the as you get less agricultural yield and therefore the plants and the crops are uh, holding less carbon. So that attributes it's a kind of side side issue in terms of climate change. But um, yeah, so essentially these substances are damaging the ozone layer. However, because of the great work of the protocol and the phasing out of CFCs, we have been able to avoid roughly 1.5 degrees down temperature increase. And the ozone layer is actually on its way to recovery. A, most, a more recent report from the UN, from the assessment panel, um, says that we are roughly on the track by 2066 in a couple of decades for the actual healing of the ozone layer. That would be back to the same levels as when the protocol was now signed on. So that's a major achievement in terms of the Montreal Protocol. It is a major achievement, but in terms of looking at a, a few decades versus somebody having skin cancer two years from now, uh, that they, they may not want to hear about those decades. So, but with that in mind, though, what is the day-to-day -day operations of the the National Ozone Unit? So, what can what are some of those uh, incremental things that we find happening at the unit on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay, under the unit, we have a few projects running right now. We have what we call the eight CFC management plan or the um, hydrochlorofluoro management plan, phase down plan. Now these eight CFCs, these are what would have replaced the CFCs. So currently as a signatory to the protocol, we would have had various reduction targets. Currently Trinidad and Tobago is advanced in its reduction. Um, at 2020, we are well ab above our re reduction targets. Um, in terms of our day-to-day -day activities, we also have what we call within the, the wider side of the project, we also do capacity development within our refrigeration and air conditioning technicians. So we would have created the professional certification um, scheme, which is now housed at MIC. And what this really does is making sure that our technicians are properly trained, they, de they deliver on good refrigeration practices, Another important thing that we would like to encourage the sector and the technicians to become professionally certified. Um, in terms of requirements, all you need to do, you need to have at least two years experience. You also need to um, be, have a certain level of academic or certification. We do accept international certification, but something on the levels of a CBQ level two. Um, within the, also the unit, we also have another project called the Global Environmental Facility Project that houses um, the energy. For, no, so we have the Global Environmental Facility Project, which is implemented by the National Ozone Unit as well as the United Nations Development Program. And what this really deals with is with energy efficiency and how we promote these energy efficient um, low carbon technologies. So essentially, cooling in terms of it's everywhere. We have cool chain. The, the vaccines, all these things. So it really underpins our society in terms of health, the mobile sector, everything we do in terms of the residents, the, the buildings that we stay in. So the, we really try to, what the aim of this project is, is to really push the market towards low carbon, low and uh, high efficiency equipment that can help achieve our goals as well as the regional goals. And we continue the conversation when we return from this break. We are speaking with Jonathan Bolai, an ozone specialist at the National Ozone Unit Ministry of Planning and Development. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are speaking with ozone specialist at the National Ozone Unit, Ministry of Planning and Development, Jonathan Bolai. And you gave us some of the initiatives that the unit is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that makes me want to ask about the, the contributions. Because, yes, you're saying that this 
coal technology, coal chains, they're everywhere about, out there. they're pervasive. But how does the unit really say that over the years, they've helped to influence some of the things that we do on, on, on a national level? Okay, thank you for the question. So the unit in particular, we work with various implementing agencies or state agencies. One in particular is the trade licensing unit. So how we are able to regulate what comes into the country or consumption is what we would have developed. It's called the ODS licensing system. We also um, have, we also were able to, add, um, we we're also able to advance um, our policy and legislative framework in terms of revising the negative import list. And that in terms helps us meet certain targets and allows importers to have a certain amount of, of, of refrigerants that they could bring onto the market. So that really helps us regulate what comes into the market in that terms. We also work with the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards. We have what we call labels on our refrigerants. So people are able to properly identify these refrigerants as well as our equipment. We have also worked with the Ministry of Health um, and this brings me to a very important point, which I'll get to in terms of the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. But we work with the Ministry of Health in the sense that we have um, basically enforced the Dr. Chemicals and, 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 and Chemicals Act Schedule 1. So any importer bringing in any amount of fluorides will need to apply for a license under this piece of legislation. Um, as I mentioned before, which I really want to hone into right now, is our most recent amendment called the Kigali Amendment. Now, this deals with um, a particular group of gases called HFCs, or hydrofluorocarbons. Now, these gases, although they're not ozone depleting, they have a kind of a warming effect on the planet. So what we call a high, um, GWP, global warming potential. So these gases basically trap, earth, um, trap heat, and warm the planet and contribute to climate change. Now, many people aren't really aware of how these equipments, and I will kind of tie in the energy efficiency aspect, which I spoke to about earlier, how cooling attributes to climate change. So when, as I mentioned before, when technicians aren't properly trained in good refrigerant practices, that, is, that when those gases are vented, that's called direct emissions. The indirect emissions now comes from how energy efficient these equipments are. So how they pull from the power. So the more efficient our equipment is, the less power it pulls from the grid. Um, that being said, as I said before, we have this Jeff project that we're working on and we are essentially promoting these energy efficient technologies. An important aspect of the project though is the district cooling. So we have partnered with two major private sector entities and we're basically um, deploying what we call district cooling. So you have a, within a closed loop system, you have cool air or, or cool water, similar to what a cent how centralized AC works, cool air or cool water chilling multiple different buildings. And this again helps with energy efficiency and it helps with um, our global and our, our regional and national emission reductions. Roughly you get about a 35% reduction from, from, from the system. Um, so you'll need for the multiple split units, as you say, or, or you know what I mean, less infrastructure. And what's unique about the, the district cooling pilot sites is that we're using what we call low GWP refrigerants. So again, the impact towards the environment is significantly less. Now, you say that, Mr. Bola, and it sounds, it sounds like, I don't want to say a better roses, but I'm sure uh, there'll be some challenges because this feels a little different to what uh, is traditionally used in terms of cooling and even like looking and saying, okay, well, we're dealing with this area, we're dealing with this cluster, we're dealing with this housing unit. Um, what are some of the challenges the, the unit will be facing? And even before that, let me ask about the energy efficiency project. Thank you. What's, what's underpinning it and what's the, what's the rationale behind it? So the energy efficiency project is really aimed at transforming or creating a development pathway to really transform the cooling sector, as I said earlier. Um, as I mentioned, the district cooling aspect is a, a subset of or a component of the project. 
We also have demonstration projects running in Tobago, where we're introducing what we call low carbon refrigerations, um, refrigerants within the, the tourism sector. So we have little data loggers basically um, assessing the efficiency of what it was before. And we're introducing what we call R290 split units. So these, these, efficient, these units that are split would roughly take up anywhere between 25 to 30 percent less energy as opposed to what is commonly found on the market, which is the R410A or the HFCs, as I, I would have rightly said. Um, just recently, we had the Energy Chamber Conference showcasing the, the, the project, um, about the different attributes of the project in terms of legislative framework. One of another important aspect of the project is what we would have developed with the um, Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards called the Minimum Energy Performance Standards. Now, this is a voluntary, right now it's quite voluntary. So the equipment that's coming in, you would have a basically a grade and depending how efficient or depending on the energy efficiency ratio of the equipment in terms of its cooling capacity and its output, we determine how what rating each um, equipment gets. So this is for both refrigeration and air conditioning. We're also um, tackling various aspects of sustainable cooling. So we're looking at passive cooling in various buildings. We're, talking, we're in conversations with the Green Building Council to see how we can deploy more green, urban green spaces. Um, in terms of uniqueness on nothing kind technologies, we're also touching a bit on what we call cooling as a service where you basically have a provider within the district cooling setup that would be selling cool air to various off takers. Now, this is quite unique in its sense because it hasn't been done in Trinidad as yet, or in terms of how it's being rolled out and in terms of the type of refrigerants that are being used. But um, the project is quite innovative and ambitious in its um, implementation. And we get the level of ambition there, but take me back to something in terms of that before and after done in Tobago. How big is that range? Because I'm sure there may be individuals wondering, it makes sense to make that change, boy. How much money are saving? How much money will I save over time? What do you say to that person? So the two pilot sites, in terms of in terms of the demo of the district cooling is in Trinidad, the demonstration sites, what we have is on a smaller scale in Tobago, and that basically is the R290 split units. So we have two tourism hoteliers that are implementing this type of technology right now. So with funding from the Global Environmental Facility, we're able to deploy this type of technology um, and, and basically showcase its benefits. So the, the intent is that when others see what these hoteliers are doing, they would follow suit. You give me exact money, you know, but at the same time, how do people get into contact with you so they can get a little more information about the work of the unit, possibly latch on to, to be, I, I don't want to say guinea pigs, to test the system, the new system. So give me that contact information, thanks. So I encourage all persons that are interested in getting to know about the project to go towards our National Ozone Unit blog, or we also have a Jeff um, Energy Efficiency webpage on Facebook. To get any more, to get as much information as you want, um, we also want to promote our professional certification um, scheme. So we ask you to reach out to MIC for those who are interested in becoming professionally certified, um, and instances like that. So you can also email the ministry, ask for the national ozone unit, and we're readily available to help or build capacity, showcase the technologies, and really introduce new, sustainable, low-carbon, efficient technologies onto, the, on, into our, and onto our market. And even building that capacity to be able to deal with those systems, I think it makes sense to be ahead of the curve so that when you have people there and they have the things, you already have people who can uh, assist, who can give them what it is they need, as opposed to you're running after the fact. We want to thank you very much, Mr. Bolai, Jonathan Bolai, Ozone Specialist, looking uh, out from the National Ozone Unit at the Ministry of Planning and Development, how we can be a little more energy efficient. And uh, on behalf of the entire TTT News team, this has been In-Depth with me, DK Ronstar. Thank you so much for joining us.